Okay, I think we can get started. So, hello everyone. My name is Jakub Wondorowski. I work as a DevOps engineer at Diva E. Uh, and today I'd like to show you uh, the WebAssembly use case in the context of edge computing. So if you've been working with web standards for a while, you are certainly familiar with those three technologies, so that famous trio. But the truth is, this is no longer a trio. It is a quartet these days. So aside from HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, there is a WebAssembly component, which has been recently added to the web stack. And this is like, has been around for a while. Um, in 2017, that's been approved by W3C, so World Wide Web Consortium, uh, as an official standard. And it is like available in every single modern browser, most likely the browser that you use to, to see that uh, session currently uses WebAssembly under the hood. So before we start uh, digging into WebAssembly in context of edge computing, let's explain what WebAssembly really is. And it's going to be like a super quick crash course on WebAssembly. There's one important note here. Whenever I say WebAssembly or WASM, that's essentially the same thing. So WASM is like an abbreviation of WebAssembly. And like with any technology these days, it is super hard to avoid the buzzword bingo. I think that the, the comic strip that you see currently is like self-explanatory. There's a lot of like buzzwords flying around here and there, but I promise to do my best to avoid the situation that is presented here on the screen. So WebAssembly, what it really is. So by definition, WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a conceptual virtual machine. And for some of you, it's probably like a vague statement, which does not mean much. And I totally get it as like, that was my first impression as well. What, what's that conceptual machine here? Mm. It is also a compilation target for other languages. So like you can take your existing code base and compile that into WebAssembly binary. Mm. As I said before, it is supported in like all the browsers that are out there, maybe not all, but vast majority of them. I'm gonna show you a screenshot in a second. Uh, but it, it's just out there, and, and quite a few applications uh, benefit from that um, constantly, nearly since the moment uh, it was released. But it quickly, like, even though it was like WebAssembly was designed with browser technologies in mind, it quickly, they, they quickly, people responsible uh, for WebAssembly quickly realized that it's, it can be like run outside of the browser as well. And we're going to talk about that um, during the session. So here's the screenshot of can I from can I use uh, that com site uh, about WebAssembly. I took it yesterday, so it's fairly up to date. And as you can see, pretty much every single browser supports WebAssembly. So unless you run like IE 11 or Opera Mini, uh, you, you can't benefit from WebAssembly. But if you're on like Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, or any other browser listed here. You can, you can run uh, WebAssembly applications. So let's get back to that conceptual virtual machine concept. So typically, if you work with compiled languages like Go, C++, or Rust, instead of going directly to individual architectures like ARM or MIPS or x86, uh, there's a, that man in the middle here uh, called IR, which stands for Intermediate Representation. It's there because of performance reasons. So it would be quite inefficient for every single language to implement its own like way to convert the code to particular architecture type. So instead, of, we have that man in the middle box, which is like architecture agnostic representation of your code. And it, it, is, that, it is a job of that intermediate representation to actually convert that into individual like architecture, so a, a x86, for example. But if we'd like to place a WebAssembly here on the diagram, it's going to look like this. So 
the, the intermediate representation is not directly converted to like a code, a binary that can run on top of x86 architecture, but it's a WebAssembly representation and it's WebAssembly's job to make sure that it can run on ARM or other architectures. And that should sound familiar to you. So it, conceptually, it is super similar to, to, to JVM and like Java ecosystem. It's, it's supposed to work like that there as well. Of course, we know how it ended, but eventually um, the WebAssembly concept is super similar to, to, to the way uh, JVM was designed. So what are the features of WebAssembly? First of all, it, it is a polyglot. So if you prefer to um, develop in Python rather than in Ruby or in C++ versus C Sharp, as long as you can compile that code to WebAssembly, you're good to go. Uh, the WebAssembly specification is also super simple. So it is essentially a set of like under the hood, it operates on numbers and linear memory. That, that's essentially what it does. Uh, that makes it super small and portable as that was one of the principles after all. Uh, it is also streamable. So if you think about the, the, the browser uh, use case, you don't have to download the entire binary to start processing your WebAssembly module, which is kind of handy as that speeds things up. And all of that, that linear memory model, um, that, that simple specification makes it fast and secure. But what, what do I really mean by fast? So here's a, a diagram uh, which represents startup time of three different units. So on the, the first yellow bar uh, is a Docker container. It roughly needs 125 milliseconds, but please bear in mind that the y-axis on the left-hand side is in microseconds. So 125 milliseconds, and which may not sound like a lot, but if you run hundreds of thousands of millions of containers, that kind of matters. Like, and 125 milliseconds is, is not uh, enough. It, essentially, it's too long. In the middle, we have a JavaScript function, which was executed on top of Google's V8 JavaScript engine. And it roughly needs like five milliseconds to start. And the third bar, which is invisible uh, here, uh, is the WebAssembly application, which runs in Lucet, which is one of the WebAssembly runtimes. We're going to talk about them uh, in a second. And that needs 35 microseconds. So if you compare that, it's like a couple of order of magnitudes faster, which, which is essentially that speed that WebAssembly brings to the table. And the, the characteristics of that means that you can run hundreds, thousands, millions of those instances simultaneously really, really fast. So until now, I've been telling you that WebAssembly is a binary format, but there is a text representation of that, which is called WAT. Um, that stands for WebAssembly text. So here's an example of that. Uh, this is not something that you'd like to work with on a daily basis, uh, but that allows you to like convert your binary into the text and the other way around uh, and see what, uh, how the, the program actually looks like in, from WebAssembly perspective or what your compiler did. Uh, so it is a no brainer here. We just add two integers to each other here, but for, for debugging purposes, you can have a look at the, the way uh, world looks like from, from WebAssembly, WebAssembly perspective. And some of you may be like, okay, that's like yet another JavaScript framework or like JavaScript-ish framework or something like that uh, that's been announced. But uh, some people say that it's gonna be pretty important in the upcoming years. So here's the statement, a tweet from 2019 from Solomon Hikes. He's a co-creator of Docker. And he said that they wouldn't have needed to create Docker if Wasm and Wasi existed, existed in 2008, which is a kind of a bold statement, uh, especially if you take into consideration that Docker um, is a quite an important technology these days. And that initialized all that containerization thing and all the technologies that based on that are based on containers. 
Uh, and if you're wondering what WASI stands for, WASI is a WebAssembly system interface, and it is uh, a new set of interfaces uh, that is being currently developed uh, to simplify the way your web application, uh, your, uh, not web application, but web assembly application interacts with external world. So how to interact with network interfaces or file system as that may vary by the environment that your application runs on top of. So like if you run your web uh, WASM application in the browser and you print a string, you expect it to appear in your dev console log. But if you do the same on the server side application, most likely you'd like to have that line written to some sort of a log file. And that's what WASI is all about. All right. So that was a bit about WebAssembly, but you probably recognize those names and those logos here. And these technologies or products, they use WebAssembly currently. So if you've worked recently with like Figma or you've visited Google Earth recently, uh, or maybe uh, you bought something from a site that happens to use Shopify, you've used WebAssembly without even realizing that you're doing that. So you can actually try that on your own. Like if you go to earth.google.com and you open up the developer console, you're going to see that WASM binary is being downloaded to your browser. Not that long ago, like two or three weeks ago, Adobe announced that they've managed to compile Photoshop into a WebAssembly module that can run in the browser at neural native speed, which is quite an achievement. Like if you take into account how big the Photoshop code base is and how much processing power it needs to like process all those images and you can run it in the browser with just opening a link, that's, that's a huge thing. But we're not going to talk about uh, the WebAssembly in the browser context today. We're going to focus on the server side. So what we need to run an application in, on the server side, I mean, Web, WebAssembly application. Uh, of course, first of all, you need a compiler. That's a no-brainer. Uh, for some languages, the, the WASM compiler is provided by the language itself. So in the Golang ecosystem, that's exactly how it works. Uh, but in certain situations, for example, in, in C++ ecosystem, you need a special tool, and that most likely will be mscript, and which was designed to convert C++ code base into a WebAssembly binary. And once you have that binary, you need to run it somewhere as it's not self-sufficient. So uh, you need some sort of a runtime, like your Java code needs JVM, so the same kind of concept. And there is a plenty of runtimes. So there are tools like Wasmer, which is like a generic WebAssembly runtime. Um, there is a Wasm time, which was developed by Mozilla initially. Um, but right now it is like part of that uh, Bytecode Alliance initiative, which gathers companies like Microsoft, Google, Fastly, and many others to work on WebAssembly future. And Wasm time is a part of that. Lucid, for example, was developed by Fastly so they can run. Mm, a lot of like potentially untrusted code in isolation in an efficient manner. So, but you can think about like other use cases, like maybe there's a, a there's a runtime which focuses on low memory devices. So, the sky is the limit here. Um, speaking about edge computing, as that's what we're gonna focus today. Mm, there's plenty of solutions or plenty of services that you can use today. So, Fastly has that. Compute at Edge capability, which allows you to run your web applications, uh, web assembly applications on their platform. And there's a uh, Cloudflare Workers, which is essentially an equivalent of the Fastly offering. Mm, but instead of like running only WASM uh, workloads, you can also deploy like Node.js application there. Uh, there are also like provider independent solutions. So WASM, uh, WASM Edge, which is uh, under CNCF umbrella currently. Um, and there are like totally not related to, to WebAssembly solutions like AWS Lambda at Edge. Of course, like if you're like stubborn enough, you can like incorporate your a piece of uh, WASM module in, in your let's say Node.js application and deploy that to Lambda at Edge. Uh, but they do not like support at least not currently. They do not support native uh, WASM workloads. 
So, okay, so enough theory, let's uh, focus on the real example. So here's an, a, an architecture um, of a sample application. So on the far left, you have your user. In the middle, in that grayish box, there's a Fastly layer, which is composed out of several services. We're gonna talk about them in a second. And on the right-hand side, we have a several backend systems that we're gonna integrate, uh, integrate with and, and exchange data. Mm. So at the top, you have some identity provider, which speaks OF2. Then you have some API, which provides some dynamic information. Then there's uh, your CMS, which is responsible for serving static content. And in this case, it may run in Kubernetes. It doesn't really matter. As long as it talks HTTP, it should be fine. And at the bottom, there is a um, metric or monitoring layer, uh, which is like Grafana and Loki in this case. So we're gonna exchange information with those services, but in the middle, we have a couple of different services. So you probably spotted that already, that some of those boxes have that WebAssembly icon in the bottom right corner. Uh, those are those WASM services that we're gonna uh, talk about in detail. Uh, and there's one service without it, uh, which is like a generic, totally not related to WebAssembly service, as like there are two types of services in Fastly. So Fastly like offers you the regular service, which is based on the VCL, which stands for Varnish Configuration Language. So Varnish is like a caching proxy system um, that Fastly uses and it hoods to, to deliver content to you. Uh, and you have those WASM services, uh, which you can deploy to uh, Fastly uh, computing layer. Uh, currently, they support free languages, so you can do that in Rust, Assembly Script, and JavaScript. Uh, for those of you who've never heard about Assembly Script, that's uh, like a strongly typed version of the TypeScript. Okay, so let's break it down one by one. So, what that front door service really does? So, first of all, that's a caching layer. It's responsible to cache your HTTP objects and serve them to your users. Of course, that's distributed across the world in many, many locations uh, to make it performant and reduce that time to first byte. So like that, that cache layer is as close to you as possible. Then it is also an HTTP router. So like it's gonna delegate or dispatch your requests to individual origins. So let's say that if you um, received a request which looks like uh, a JPEG file request, then it's going to be routed directly to your CMS. Uh, of course, you can do some various request response normalization, mm, things like removing cookies, enriching the request with, let's say, geolocation information. And the same applies to the response. Maybe you have a backend, which is some sort of legacy application. And that sometimes misbehaves or mm, re, uh, attaches some data that you don't want to expose to end users. So you can like strip certain headers or process the response in this way or another. And of course, that's also a security layer. Not only it like protects you from all sorts of denial of service attacks, but also uh, you can like have your own logic here, which says if that request looks completely off, like, I don't know, like someone is trying to visit WP admin site. And if you don't write run WordPress, you can just block that request straight away. And of course, the list goes on. That's just a few examples. So essentially an entry point. So here's a snippet of the VCL. Mm. So essentially the VCL is like a state machine, uh, which is based on subroutines. So those subroutines are responsible for transitions between various states. So in the VCL receive, which is the very first subroutine, which is triggered in, in the request processing, uh, we say that, okay, if it starts with assets and ends with SVG, PDF, PNG, JPEG, then we're gonna send it directly to our CMS. Then we have a VCL fetch, which here um, does some retries. So uh, if the app misbehaves and returns 500 or 503, we can restart the request and essentially re-request the object instead of presenting the original error to the user as maybe that was just a one-off that we can cover with, um, with a bit of configuration. All right, so now we're talking about the, the WASM itself. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a demo. Um, so Fastly provides um, 
a CLI tool called Fastly. That's a no-brainer. Uh, it allows you to interact with their API, but we're going to focus on that compute capabilities. And there are, there are three steps, important steps here. So there is that init, build, and deploy. So init is all about um, like generating a boilerplate code uh, that you can use as a skeleton for further development. Build takes your source code and produces a binary, WebAssembly binary, and deploy pushes that binary to Fastly. So let's do a little bit of a demo here. So let me make that a bit bigger. Uh, so here's a, I run the init, uh, Fastly compute init command before. And as you can see, I have a, quite a few directories here. Some of those are not required at the moment as they're like essentially related to the output, which we're going to produce here. So let me remove the bin package and target directories as they're like dynamic and they're ignored in the get ignore file. So here's how the, the project looks like essentially. So that's the structure. So cargo is a, as the service itself is written in, in a Rust. So that's why we have that mine, uh, main uh, RS file. And the cargo is a package manager for us. Uh, that's like that cargo lock and cargo toml are equivalents of, if you're familiar with JavaScript or in Node.js specifically, that's like your package JSON and package JSON lock. Mm. The Fastly, Fastly toml file is a metadata file, which is not that really, uh, not that important. The important bit is that uh, that, that RS file. So let me open it up. Um, so this is a super simple um, logic here. Uh, essentially, we do two things. So if we send a request to with a get or head method, it's going to be accepted. If that's uh, another method, it's going to be rejected. Simple as that. Uh, and we're going to uh, get far, uh, 405 status code back. And then we have some path processing. So whenever we visit just a slash, we're going to get some HTML back, which is also shipped with the, um, uh, with the application, the, the WASM application here. Uh, and if, if that's something else, we're going to get a 404 with some predefined message. So let's try to build it real quick. Fastly um, compute build. And what happens here is that we're going to First of all, we need to fetch all the dependencies and compile uh, them into a single binary. I've removed those target bin package directories before, so it's going to take a while, but it's not that long. It's just a couple of seconds. And we should get uh, a tarball uh, out of that process. Um, so right now, it's like compiling all the built-in libraries that you have to have in your code to run your WASM application uh, in Fastly. So let's wait for that to happen. All right, I think we're almost done. All right. And the process is done. And as you can see, we have a tarball back from the, from the process. So let me open it up. Mm, it contains that wasn't binary. We can open it up. Uh, that's indeed a binary. Uh, and we have two metadata files, which are not that important. So we're going to, uh, actually, they are important, but they're not important for the sake of the demo. So let me just ignore them for now. Uh, OK, so once we have it, we can push it to Fastly. So fastly compute deploy. And when that's done, we should get a URL back uh, here, which is this. And that's going to be this one. So I can refresh it, and I'm going to get the HTML that um, I prepared. You can admire my HTML skills here. Um, so that's essentially what we've just deployed. But um, it's not that like fancy here as it that like I've I've never met, meant to like uh, do it fancy here as it, it's not the purpose of the whole thing. But we can test the um, uh, that method filtering aspect here. So let me let me just 
send like a post request, for example, and we're gonna get this method is not allowed. We can do it with dash b just to see that we get far for 405. But we can apply some changes here real quick. So let me change the branch, which I prepared up front. Uh, that adds a new uh, endpoint, which is port slash UA, which is supposed to echo the user agent back to us. Uh, so let's recompile the project and deploy it again. Mm. And so compute build. And fastly compute deploy. As you can see, it was much faster this time as I didn't have to re-download all the dependencies. Okay, that's done. It was fairly quick. And now if I go to sorry, like that, process UA. Uh, yeah, now I can see my user agent back. Of course, you can just do the same locally and I can put some dummy data inside. Uh, like, let me do it like this. Uh, okay. Yeah, and it prints it back. Uh, on top of that, you can also debug the application locally. Uh, so if we go fastly compute serve, we're gonna get a URL to a local host application, which is essentially the same thing that runs in Fastly. Uh, so, but it runs on my machine, so I can like plug any debugger or whatever is required and just troubleshoot the application, which is kind of handy. Of course, that does not mean that you have like full access to the entire ecosystem. Uh, that fastly runs as a lot of things are just not available and silently ignored. But the good thing is that you can just run the same payload locally. All right, so let me stop it and let's go back to the presentation. All right, so that was a little bit of a demo. Um, now let's talk about uh, the second thing that we had on the high level architecture diagram, which is content stitching. So if you've been working with template rendering technologies before, and you happen to have that at the edge for content delivery network layer, uh, you've typically used uh, a thing called edge side includes, which is like essentially the same thing that old good server side includes does, which is like filling up placeholders uh, with some markup, simple as that. But there are more advanced libraries that you can use here. So if you're from the JavaScript ecosystem, you've probably heard about Handlebars, which is quite popular. Um, if you're in a um, Python world, you most likely work with Jinja2 templates, and there is like a Rust equivalent of that, uh, which is called Terra. There is the Liquid language, which was developed by Shopify originally for Ruby, but now it's been backported to other languages, and the list goes on. Okay, so how can we benefit out of that uh, using Wasm services at the edge? So here's yet another example. Uh, so our user is going to request uh, a product page, which is first will be picked up by our front door service. And the front door service says, okay, that's a product request. Let's proxy that to our server side rendering service. Um, so that service uh, receives the request and requests uh, a product template from the CMS uh, and it gets something like that back. So simple HTML markup with some placeholders. Then the, the service requests a dynamic data, which is like product information, like what is the description, price, uh, like I don't know, amount of um, items on stock, etc. We're gonna get that back. Um, and the service is essentially like stitching the, the template with the data uh, at the edge caches that responses, replies to the front door service, and then it is like proxied back to, to the end user. So fairly simple uh, model uh, that you can use. And of course, like upon subsequent requests, you don't have to re-request all of that. You can just most likely your request will stop here and you're gonna get that product page pretty quickly. And of course that logic here, like if you let's say use React, uh, you can have your React um, 
code running in the browser uh, on the client side, but also you can use the same code base in your WebAssembly service and just render the same HTML file or pre-render that at the edge so you can avoid extra processing uh, on the client side. All right, the, the next thing we had uh, was authentication. Um, so if you'd like to use OAuth 2, then it means you have to have uh, an identity provider which speaks OAuth 2 protocol. Um, and if you have a capability that allows you to run um, some logic at the edge and determine that given user session is or is not valid, then you can benefit from that information. And maybe you don't need to talk to your backend at all. Maybe that information for authenticated user is already available on CDN and you can serve it off of CDN directly, which is kind of cool as that like has some important performance implications. Of course, you have to be super like uh, careful here and take some extra precautions uh, as like the worst thing that can happen is that you visit the site and all of a sudden you see someone else's session. Um, that, that's something you should avoid, especially if you're in a financial industry. Uh, but it's doable. People do that and you can have like multiple variants of a single object um, at CDN, which is like session aware as well. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but we're not going to do a deep dive into that. If you're interested, here's the link you can follow and get all the details. And the last uh, information we had is, uh, or the last use case we had on that high level bird's view diagram uh, was all about content security policy. If you're not familiar with the concept, um, it is essentially a security feature of the browser that is meant to prevent cross-site scripting attacks. So your browser will receive a policy from the application in, in a form of a header, which says you can fetch JavaScript files only from that domain. You can't have any inline JavaScript in the markup and you can put, uh, or you can render an iframe only if, that's an I, if that iframe comes from domain X. So that would be an example of a policy. Um, Whenever there's a violation, so you try to request an object which is not allowed in that CSP header, uh, then the browser will issue a post request uh, with some with a JSON payload, which essentially describes that violation. So I have an example on the next slide that's going to be clearer. And if you like at the very beginning of your CSP journey, maybe further, <laughs> that's also the case, but uh, especially at the beginning, you'd like to aggregate all those violations to like tune your content security policy and make sure that all those violations um, are addressed. So you'd like to have some sort of a central system that aggregates all those violations and you can like filter that out and aggregate um, information there. So here's how it can look like. So as I said, uh, the browser will send a post request with a JSON payload. Um, so here the user visited the example.com forward slash sign up HTML. And there was a request to one, two, three CSS um, that comes from the, the markup generated by, by uh, or included in that file. Uh, unfortunately, that domain is not whitelisted in a policy. So we only allow CSS files from this domain, so assetsexample.com. Of course, that's different than cdngoogle.com. So the browser reports violation, and that violation means a post request to an endpoint that you've specified in your policy. Of course, I replaced, I removed the policy as they tend to be quite long. So just to fit it on the screenshot here, mm, I just replaced that. So the browser will send a post request, and that's going to hit the WebAssembly service. You don't have to have that regular uh, VCL-based service in front. You can expose those services directly to end users. And the job of that will be super simple. Just take the post request, convert it into a log message, maybe enrich that with some extra information like 
add uh, a request ID or a user session or some identifier of, of that user. Mm, so that can be correlated easily. Mm, and just, that's it. Just log the request and log streaming will happen in the background completely transparently. You don't need to bother about it. So essentially, the transformation of a post payload into a log entry, that, that's what it does. All right, so what are the, what are the use cases uh, or typical use cases for um, edge computing? So content stitching, that's what you've seen before. Uh, you can do all sorts of A-B testing. Um, you can do authentication, like in that OAuth 2 um, sneak peek that I've presented. You can do all sorts of personalization. So if you'd like to, I don't know, list uh, uh, a product teasers that are like targeted to specific users or specific user groups, you can use a uh, WebAssembly service at the edge that like correlates your user with some personalization data for that user and just render that um, instead of like generic information. Ad targeting or even games. Like some people were crazy enough to uh, run Doom at the edge. So one of the Fastly developers, uh, he compiled the original C++ Doom code base into WebAssembly module. And the only thing that he changed is the way that uh, the view you see here is rendered. So instead of like rendering that on the client side, they send a lot of requests to um, uh, to the to the WebAssembly service, which does the rendering and provides you a, a frame like a, a rendering frame back to your browser. So that's that's super fast. That's like you need like 15, 20 milliseconds to get that frame back, and that the rendering process is happening at the edge in the browser. You just get a frame by frame from that edge service, which is which is kind of like mind blowing as that game is perfectly playable in the browser, but the rendering process happens outside of the browser, which is like kind of crazy. But like people have been experimenting with various other things, like like someone took the AutoCAD code base and compiled that to WebAssembly. So there are literally like crazy and mind blowing things happening out there with, with WebAssembly. All right, so what is, what is the, the state of edge computing today? So um, right now, Fastly supports us like only three languages, uh, but I believe that more will come uh, shortly. So Rust is like, uh, if, you, if you've never heard about Rust, this is like a language developed by Mozilla um, originally. And this is, you can, you can think of it like a reference implementation for WebAssembly, as I believe that the, the first experiments were um, we're using Rust as a that higher level language. Uh, assembly script, that's that's what I told you before. So a strongly typed version of TypeScript and JavaScript, which was recently added. Of course, there are some constraints. Uh, so you can, there's a maximum limit of outgoing requests that you can do as a part of that service. Uh, your binary may not exceed 50 megabytes and there are some CPU and, and memory limits as well. So yeah, the, the, the WebAssembly is out there, both in the browser and on the server side. And I do believe that it's going to be more significant than it is today with every single month uh, in the future. So this is something you should definitely um, pay attention to and have a look at, as that's something that's uh, really important for the future of the web. All right, that's all I had. Thank you so much. Let me open up chat and see what we have here. Uh, okay, so uh, when it comes to backend, uh, there's a question from Shimon. Uh, so, there's a lot going on when it comes to WebAssembly on the server side. So there are some, I forgot the name of that particular tool, but there's a, there's a tool that essentially tricks Kubernetes that 
instead of running containers, you can run WASM applications directly on top of Kubernetes, which is, well, <laughs> kind of fits into that uh, narrative of, of Solomon Hikes that maybe Docker will be replaced by something else at, at some point in time. Uh, there's some, uh, Shopify does a lot of um, backend processing with WebAssembly as well. Um, I'm not quite sure if they made that public or announced that publicly, but I've heard about uh, that. So there are certainly there are certainly there are certainly some work going on uh, that implies uh, WebAssembly on the server side. It's probably like too early in the life cycle of that technology to be super popular, but I think it's going to be more and more popular. Uh, over the upcoming years, as like the the speed and portability is super important, and it's going to be even more important um, in the future. So yeah, hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. And of course, that WebAssembly in the in the browser itself is also a thing, and I think that that's going to be the first iteration. Uh, of WebAssembly adoption. So like using WebAssembly directly in the browser. Mm, but at some point, I, I do expect um, a, a lot of WebAssembly based server-side applications. All right. I don't see any other questions. So yeah, we still have three minutes, but I think that would be it. Thank you so much.